So, Katie Herzog, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So, there's a theme of controversy over kind of trans activism, as there always seems to be, but it seems to have reached a little bit of a peak in the US around the Chappelle, Dave Chappelle special, in the UK around Kathleen Stock and some recent revelations around Stonewall. And I'm fascinated by this topic, as many of us terminally online people are, <laughs> mainly because of the window that it shines on the media and how yes. we cover these topics. And I think maybe you'd say the same. It's not necessarily a, an interest in, in the topic itself. It's more like, what does it say about what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say, how things are framed, how that divides this sort of the, the, the kind of elite discourse from the rest of the discourse. Um, maybe let's start by sort of talking about that. What, what do you think? Why do you think this topic in particular seems to attract this kind of level of interest? My, my biggest feeling is like how unfair and how bizarre and, un, and tragic it is for, for trans people to find that this particular topic is one that keeps coming up and keeps being discussed. And it seems like, yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah that, that feels like a bit of a tragedy in a way. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. Although there are probably some terminally on trans people, online trans people who absolutely love it and love sort of becoming the story. You know, you're right. My interest in this is primarily uh, what it says about the wider culture, specifically the media and what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say. I do, however, think there is something fundamentally interesting about changing one sex. Um, you know, and you can see back in the 90s when I was like, I don't know if this is something that you do in the UK, but, you know, you, you, you're homesick from school one day and you turn on Jerry Springer or these tabloid shows, talk shows. And there's always somebody who, who comes out and says, I was, you know, I'm really a man or I'm really a woman. I was, I, I'm going through a sex change. So there is something I think sort of fundamentally from the very beginning of, uh, you know, Christine Jorgensen, the first, the first woman who, who had sex change surgery. I think there is something fundamentally interesting to us about this. The idea that you could change something so fundamental to who you are, that's interesting, but yes, why, but it's also very it's a small population. So why has this small population taken up so much brain space, so much space in the culture? Part of it is because the population is growing. That's also interesting. This thing that was very, very rare is becoming increase increasingly less so, increasingly common, especially among younger people, among different populations. Um, so there's that. And I also think part of this is a natural, the sort of natural evolution of progress in terms of the, the, let's say, I hate the term queer, but let's say the queer rights movement. So you have gay marriage, when gay marriage was legalized, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the United States in 2015, you had all these organizations in this massive apparatus, media apparatus and nonprofit apparatus devoted to this one issue, to gay marriage. And then when gay marriage was a success, when it was legal, when it was common in the, you know, common in the United States, all of these organizations, instead of doing the thing that they might've done, which is shut down, say, we did it, you know, pat yourself on the back, now go get a different job. They pivoted. So there's this wide apparatus that was focusing on this one really fundamental issue, the ability for gay people to get married and other tangential issues, housing, non-discrimination, job protection, things like that. But it all pivoted. So you had this, you know, and when it was focused, when the apparatus was focused, when these nonprofits were focused on, on gay rights, it's a much larger population, or at least one would think a much larger population than trans rights. So you have that. And then the media follows suit. Um, so I think there's a lot of compounding factors here that make trans rights the the thing that uh, that drives wedges between populations and parties and, and takes up so much cultural brain space. It is a strange, like it is such a small population that it's like we're talking about like redheads or something like that. Um, but yeah, I also think there's something just fundamentally interesting about this idea that you could be born a woman and die a man. Yeah, and what you just said about the campaigning organizations, I think an amazing case study is Stonewall in the UK. And what's going on at the moment in the UK is really fascinating. The, the kind of change of the media conversation around that, BBC, and we'll come to that in, in, a, in a bit because I'm also interested in whether there are significant differences between the US and the UK. And also this kind of allied question of, has the woke wave kind of peaked? And this is such a fascinating topic, like even woke more generally, but this, this topic as well is like people can, 
you can use confirmation bias to make any kind of argument that you want. You can say, oh, it's getting worse. No, it's getting better. And it's very hard to kind of judge. I mean, I will, I will make a case that there do seem to be quite significant changes, especially in the UK. And I'm really fascinated to know whether that, whether you have the same sense in the US. And we'll, we'll come to that in a moment after we talk about the Chappelle special. And I should have, I should have said that's when I introduced you, but you're the co-host of Blocked and Reported, uh, which I listen to a lot uh, with some other guy whose name I can never remember. But, Me too. Uh, I can never remember his name either. Jesse, Jesse something. Yeah, Jesse Single, who, who's also, um, yeah, is, is, is your straight man, I think, to the, to the, <laughs> funny, the, the funny person that you play on the, on the show. <laughs> Presumably um, straight. That hasn't yeah. been confirmed. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave that. We'll put a flag <laughs> that later. Um, yeah, and what I really love about your, your show is that you, you talk about these incredibly polarizing culture war topics, but you do it with a real level of empathy and care and nuance. And sounds like you put a lot of, a lot of effort into that. And I, yeah, I, I'd highly recommend it. And these are topics that are incredibly polarizing and can be weaponized so much on both sides. Yeah. And yeah, what, what do you make about that sort of carving out a space for this conversation that can get incredibly heated, but where do you see it sort of being weaponized on both sides before we go into the Chappelle conversation? Yeah, I think it is absolutely weaponized on both sides. Our, our, obviously, our political parties are different here in the U.S. than in the U.K., but what we have here going on in the U.S. is basically a reaction. And then a, uh, there's an event, and then there's a backlash, and then there's a backlash to the backlash, and then there's a backlash to the backlash to the backlash, and it becomes, and trans rights have become this, uh, this rallying point among both the right and the left. So you'll have a state like Connecticut, very liberal state, they'll make some law that says that trans girls should be allowed to play and have to be allowed to play in high school sports and then across the country in idaho you have the response to that which is idaho making a law that says no trans girls are banned from playing in in in, uh, in high school sports and and so much our, of our politics is local and state then you really we really do live in almost two different americas because much of this there are federal policies of course but a lot of this comes down to state by state level and it's a way of virtue signaling on both sides. So the issue of trans women and women's sports, this affects a very small number of people. This isn't to say it's not important, but it affects a very, very minor number of people, both female athletes and the potential trans women who might be, might be uh, competing with them. If we were in a position where there were tons and tons of trans women entering into high school sports, that would be maybe different, but this is, it's pretty minor. It's once again, I think they're sort of inherently fascinating, but it has become this, uh, this real rallying cry for politicians to fundraise around these issues, uh, to become famous. This, you see the same things in fights about critical race theory uh, and these other cultural, cultural war issues that then become political issues. And I wish all this stuff could stay in the culture. I wish we could fight about it online and in the media and not have the actual government involved, but that's just not how things work here. Um, a, a lot of it I think is really, it's a, it's a way of fundraising. It's a way of, of, of sticking your flag in the ground and saying like, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. And I'm saying this on both sides, you know, conservatives feel that way and liberals feel that way, whatever their position might be. Um, so it is, I think, very unfortunate that, you know, actual human beings get caught in the crossfire here. Hmm. And let's, let's maybe move on to the Dave Chappelle special, because that's the one that's really kind of cut through over the last week or two. Um, yeah, what did, what did you make of it generally? I thought it was very funny. I'm not, I don't watch a ton of stand up, so I don't have much to compare it to. A lot of people who are Chappelle fans and, uh, and know Mac, more of his back catalog than I do say that it's not his best special. I laughed. I thought it was offensive, but I don't think there's anything wrong with offensive humor. I think comedy should be offensive. Um, it doesn't have to be, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, and parts of it, he did, you know, he got a lot of facts wrong, but I don't think that really matters. Like at one point, he uh, he's talking about JK roll. Is it rolling or rowling? I always have to ask him rowling. about it. Rowling. Okay. He's talking about JK rowling. And he says that JK rowling's basic stance is that gender is a fact. That's not actually what her stance is. Her stance is that sex is a fact. And of course, like, 
this gets into sort of the weeds of the difference between sex and gender and if there is, is really a difference and that depends on who you're asking. So he gets these sort of basic facts wrong. I don't care because it's comedy and comedy is not does not have to be factual. Probably would have been stronger if he had gotten the, if he'd gotten the facts correct. But from just a, 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 a comedy standpoint, I found it very funny even in parts where I thought like, ooh, that is, that is offensive. It still to me was funny. And I have a, to a high tolerance for that sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not the, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who's gonna hear a joke about like my demographic, lesbians or white women or whatever, and, uh, and cry about it. That's just not sort of who I am. But so I think the things that were strongest about it, for one thing, it was deeply empathetic. He tells this story in the end about this, relationship that he had a, with a trans woman that was very powerful a lot of people accuse him of that of just sort of using this woman's death because she died uh to sort of score points which is probably true it was maybe def a defensive move on his part but a lot of what he said really rang true to me um and I just appreciate that he like the fact that he at one point he said you know I'm on team turf and I know a lot of feminists hate the term turf but I think there's something pretty remarkable about Dave Chappelle managing to get the word turf and headlines of, of major American papers because it's such a it's such an online niche issue. And then all of a sudden we're talking about it in the pages of whatever papers. So I, I appreciated that. I thought he. Um, you know, he is, uh, if nothing else, he is able to command attention. Yeah, and the broader context, I guess, is that the. There was such a split between the audience reaction. I think many people might have seen the kind of Rotten Tomatoes graphic that said critics, I think, gave it 33 percent. Audiences gave it 96 percent. Yeah. And like this, that, that's part of the, the, the story is like this huge rift between what you are supposed to like and what you are supposed to find funny and what people seem to actually find funny. Right. Right. Yes. And then, of course, there even more interesting than the special I thought was the reaction to it from inside Netflix. So there was of course a lot of um, <clears throat> backlash within the company, a, uh, an engineer for the employee, a trans woman uh, did this long tweet thread about how she said it was, the problem wasn't the special was that it was offensive. The problem with the special was that it was going to lead to the deaths of trans women. That's a ridiculous supposition. Um, I think the problem was that she was actually offended. Um, so she and a couple of other employees snuck into a, 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 like a corporate executive meeting and uh, they were busted and suspended for this because you can't sneak into meetings. And the interesting thing to me about this was that when you looked at the headlines about this in almost every headline, in the US that covered this story, the headline was Netflix suspends employees who criticize Dave Chappelle special. They didn't mention the fact in the headlines, at least they didn't mention the fact that the reason that these people were suspended was not because they criticized Netflix publicly, which would have been an absolute PR disaster on Netflix's part. It still was a PR disaster. Um, but anyway, they were suspended not for that, but for like crashing a meeting and pretty mm -hmm. Like and they were uh, they were uh, the suspension was revoked shortly afterwards. So that was also interesting to me mm. was just this, to see the way that the media covered this thing, going with this more salacious narrative that these people were suspended for for tweeting criticism of the company. And then the same thing happened a couple of days later. A uh, there was going to be Netflix um, employees are staging a on the twentieth. They're staging a walkout. And the person who organized the walkout was fired from the company. And so if you looked at the headlines this is what it said, Netflix employee who, who organizes protest is fired from the company. And then if you go into the actual articles, they'll say, oh, Netflix says she was fired because she leaked uh, internal metrics to the media. So she was fired, she was actually fired for leaking information, but the way a bunch of outlets framed it was she was fired for organizing this walkout. And I spoke to an employee within Netflix and he said to me, you know, Netflix is a global company. This is much bigger than just the Chappelle special. And they've really drawn a line in the sand here. And they say, and I appreciate this. They've said, there are some things that you're going to like, and there are some things that you don't like, and that is, that is fine. And we are not going to take specials down because people don't like them. I think that's a good response. So I'm, I'm in one of the positions I'm not often in, which is, uh, which is um, uh, commending a, a giant corporate entity. Yeah, and that's another, I guess that's another mark in, in the camp of 
there do seem to be these lines in the sand, like we'll, we'll come yeah. to the Catherine Stock thing in a minute and university standing up. And there's been a few different examples of that, that you could say, okay, things do seem to be changing. Right. Well, uh, when it comes down to it, I think for Netflix, at least, it's a business decision, right? Like dozens, a few dozen angry employees are not worth as much as Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle is one of the most famous, successful comedians on earth. Which is interesting because in the special, he said, oh, look, they canceled J.K. Rowling, but they didn't cancel they J.K. Didn't. Rowling. No. no, no, she's bigger than God. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't cancel somebody who is, who is, already already that rich already that successful i'm sure that mm. most people who read harry potter have no idea of any of this you know it's mm. this are like unless you're online unless you're reading lots of headlines unless you're really plugged into this i don't think most parents who are buying harry potter for their books or most kids have any idea that jk rowling is a so-called turf mm. yeah and i i listened to your podcast on this um and i think Jesse was slightly more down on the special. You were more keen on it. And Jesse had a few more concerns. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought it was really fascinating. I, th- I thought it was really funny. I really, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I had a couple of glitches in, at the same point that I think Jesse did. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fascinate, the interesting thing was the whole conversation around punching up and punching down. Yeah. And I think there was, I, I think there was a mix of both in it. I think the punching up was punching up at the kind of moral, the moral sanctimony around this conversation, which is, which is total. Like there, there is a sense of like, you can't say this and this sort of faux outrage that is kind of around this topic, the cultural dominance of this topic. And in many ways you are punching up if you're taking that on. There was some punching down, I thought at trans people, Mm -hmm. But then again, comedy is designed by comedy is yeah. offensive. It is, yeah. it is. And I, I really enjoyed Andrew Sullivan's piece about it, where he made the point, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little bit no. uh, fr- from that piece, because I thought it was a really interesting take. And Andrew Sullivan's obviously gay. Um, and he said, Chappelle is celebrating the individual human, never defined by any single identity or any intersectional variant thereof. An individual with enough agency to be able to laugh at herself and others at the world and assuming that marginalized people cannot tolerate humor at their own expenses dehumanizing as, as assuming they can have no agency in their lives right i thought it was great it's like we need to take up t- stop taking ourselves so seriously yeah and this assumption that everyone is so fragile that a joke is literally killing someone is right. is just a, a, a fundamental denial of like the human spirit yeah and i think that was broadly what Chappelle was trying to get at as well as his 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 entire the entire point in the special which seems to have been uh proven correct by the response to it was that there are certain groups particularly trans people to a lesser extent gay people who are above criticism above joke making uh you can say whatever you want about basically every other population on earth but this is the one where people are going to walk out of your special which is this is how it's playing out I also thought um you know the special itself it, it might not have been in his in his top three or whatever but I think it I think as his you know it was his final I think guess the fifth on, on his contract for Netflix it's called the closer uh as a way of sort of wrapping up the whole thing, I think he did a good job. Um, and he says that he aren't, he isn't going to be talking about gay stuff anymore. I doubt that's actually true. Um, he doesn't seem to be able to stop himself. And there's also something about, you know, there's like, there are certain lines that like, like I have a personal, like, I think it's, I think there's something like deeply wrong about making fun of uh people with down syndrome like that's something i would never do but that's my personal line in the stand right everybody's got their everybody's got their their thing and there's no reason that my thing should be take precedent over anybody else's thing right Mm. so i just i think we also have to remember that a lot of this is just a matter of taste Mm. yeah and if i was to sort of nitpick at the pieces that glitched for me there was 
um, as you mentioned, like the gender is a fact versus sex is a fact, I think yeah. was. Yeah, I think it, it shows um, that he, do, he doesn't entirely know what he's talking about, which isn't a surprise mm. because he's Dave Chappelle. He's not like spending all of his time in like gender critical forums. He's not on Mumsnet. Yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> he did spend some time on Mumsnet. Um, and the other piece was just this sort of sense that um, whenever I've talked about this topic, I've been very careful to kind of delineate trans activism or the trans lobby from trans people. Yeah. And I felt like quite a few times in the in the special, he talked about it as if all trans people think this, like it's the gay people versus the trans yeah. people. And I felt that was that was slightly unfortunate because I think there is a I think there is a difference between a sort of the ideology, the trans ideology and, and trans people themselves. Yeah, um, I think you're right. Although there are certainly people who uh, it comes from somewhere. Um, mm. You know, it, I think there's a massive difference between the average trans person in Idaho or whatever and someone like Chase Strangio at the ACLU. I don't think that the most online prominent activists speak for trans people any more than I speak for lesbians or white women or whatever. And more more generally, why do you think it is this particular topic that that give that brings so much heat into the culture? I mean, partly I think it's I think it's because the culture, certainly the cultural mainstream, is, is more left. And it's the one point where, and I think this is another line by Andrew Sullivan where he said, the debate is about whether a tiny group of fanatics empowered by every major cultural institution can compel or emotionally blackmail other people into saying things that are not true. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of an extreme, or it's it's a very black and white way of framing it. But I think there is some truth to that, especially yeah. the way the left is constantly framing the right as being the ones that deny science that are not right. following. I think you're right about this. And then there's also the fact that if you're talking about something like uh, self ID. This really does have an impact on people outside of the small population, right? That's and which in a way that isn't true when it comes to things like gay marriage. Like my marriage doesn't actually impact anybody else's marriage. It doesn't devalue a heterosexual marriage as much as I would like it to. It doesn't. But if you're talking about, you know, self ID, if you're talking about trans women in prisons, if you're talking about trans women in bathrooms or or on sports teams, this really does impact a much broader a broader part, part of the population not still not huge you know these are not like we're not talking massive numbers but also just this fundamental the fundamental rethinking of what sex is a thing that has always been sex you know this very fundamental we are mammals we come in one of two forms fundamentally rethinking that uh that's a big deal that's a massive shift in society i know people like Activists in particular, like non-binary activists, like to think that they're sort of like subverting uh, gender. I, I don't think they are. I think they're making it more intractable, but yeah. Yeah, and there's the paradox of whether the ideology is transcending gender or it's actually gender essentialist because right. it's sort of saying if you if you present, present as the opposite sex, maybe you actually are the opposite sex. Like exactly. The weird, the weird paradoxes within it. Well, and and is and using uh using stereotypes and gender roles to to indicate, you know, your sex. If I, you know, as a female, if I uh have short hair and play baseball and whatever, played with trucks as a kid, and that that actually meaning that I'm actually a male. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't see how anybody can see that as anything but deeply regressive, but yeah. yeah and we'll we'll move on in a second to Kathleen Stock because it was a really good segue with the self ID because self ID was pretty much what radicalized a lot of women in the UK in particular that the government was consulting on that but before we do just I'd maybe like to you mentioned that it affects other people it certainly affects women when you're talking about women only spaces and that's been a kind of huge rallying cry but also the the way that it affects lesbian and gay people and yeah. that sort of those rifts that have erupted within the kind of umbrella of lgbt is really fascinating i wonder if you might kind of outline i know you wrote a piece i think the, was it for barry weiss about the the that there seemed to be sort of no butch lesbians anymore oh that was for andrew sullivan um yeah so this is something that i've observed i don't have any i don't think there is any good data on this but just in my own life i have observed 
a really extraordinary number of people who would have been considered heterosexual females, lesbians, a few years ago, transitioning. And I'm not talking about people in their teenagers. I'm talking about people my age. I really should keep a spreadsheet. It's just literally just yesterday, I was scrolling through Instagram and another one of my friends announced that she or he, I suppose now, they is getting top surgery. Um, and I, 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 other people think about this. Other people have made this point. Other people in the sort of online space. But within my own friend group or the, the queer community that I have lived in since I was 20 years old. Nobody seems to think it's weird. And that to me is what's really fascinating about this and also troubling is just like, we are seeing this, I am seeing this, people are seeing this and we're supposed to ignore it. It's wild. Um, I mean, it's like, I've made this comparison before but it's almost like everybody I know got religious at the same time. Like I like one day everybody woke up and found Jesus, which is would be bizarre, and this is bizarre too. One day everybody woke up and decided they would cut their breasts off. I mean, and obviously it was more gradual than that, but it's been happening over the past decade or so. For those who are not as terminally online as we are, what what is the tension within? Like to summarize yeah. it, I, I, I guess it's that if you change the emphasis from sex to gender then that's a direct, there's organizations like the LGB Alliance that have kind of been set up to say, well, actually, right. this ideology, which replaces sex with gender, is actually a threat to, to gay and lesbian people because it replaces the thing that defines us, that we're attracted right. to the same sex. Right, um, well, same sex, yeah. Playing out? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the basic tension is that forever, uh, gay activism has been about the fact that we are homosexuals, we are same sex attracted. And now that is problematic because sex is, people are supposed to be attracted to gender. And I've never personally seen this. I've never seen this in my personal life, but I have seen online, you know, you see, you see stories, you see conversations between people who, you know, long, young lesbians say, I'm really trying to get over my aversion to penises because I know penises aren't what makes people male. Women can have penises, but I'm not attracted to them. And I'm really trying to get over this, which is conversion therapy. And that's something that under other circumstances we would have major problems with. But when it comes from trans activists or allies, this is somehow progressive. Telling people that they should force themselves or teach themselves or whatever, except the fact that some, that I should, as a lesbian, I should accept girl dick in my life. No, no, <laughs> that's crazy. That is not, that is, you know, that's not what homosexuality is. So that's the tension here is this, yeah, it's just the, the, uh, the devaluing of sex in the, in, in the place of gender identity. Mm. And let's move on a little bit to, to Kathleen Stock because that's been the thing that has really kind of exploded over here in the UK. So Kathleen Stock, who we actually had on Rebel Wisdom a while ago, she's a philosopher, an academic, uh, lesbian, and kind of probably talks a lot about sex and gender. She was basically one of the students at a university, started organizing a campaign against her. She's always had a lot of controversy following her around, but um, there was a sort of concerted attempt to to get her cancelled and the interesting thing w was that the university actually the the outgoing vice cham vice chancellor made a statement in favor of her in favor of um in favor of academic freedom and similarly fairly recently jester walls was an artist who something similar happened to her she was attempted to be cancelled from the royal academy they actually removed some art from the shop and then the Royal Academy apologized publicly. And that's two examples in a relatively small, short space of time of public institutions resisting what in the past seems to be kind of un, unstoppable calls for people to be canceled for their views on this, on this topic. Um, and then the Stonewall example is really fascinating. I maybe cover that individually, but have you been following those cases in the UK? Do you think there's a difference in the debate in the UK and the US? I do think there's a, a big difference in the debate in part because of uh, we have different legal protections. So because of our, thank God for our first amendment, um, someone like Kathleen Stock, if she were in a public university in the United States, 
would be legally entitled a, a university a public university wouldn't be allowed to take uh to to um retaliate for her speech not that it doesn't happen it does happen but it's a big deal and it's illegal here um and then also the the media is different here so there even in the guardian like the guardian uk is much more likely to publish something by a gender critical feminist than the guardian us uh, the same thing new york times here uh barry weiss's newsletter abigail she had recently abigail schreier post uh, had a piece in barry weiss's newsletter Abigail Schreier wrote a book about uh, rapid onset just gender dysphoria called Irreversible Damage, basically about teen girls deciding that they're trans sort of suddenly, um, oftentimes in congruence with their friends doing the same thing. And uh, Abigail interviewed these two uh, two clinicians, one of whom was a surgeon well known for doing a vaginal vaginoplasty or the creation of a neo-vagina. And then another, her name is Marcy Bowers and another clinician uh, named Erica Anderson and both of them said things that uh, were unexpected. Erica Anderson, less so. She's she's sort of been more outspoken about the need for better assessments for youth transition. But Marcy Bowers said some things that I think were very shocking to her trans friends um, and allies about uh, about the need for basically more gatekeeping. Uh, very unpopular position within this within, within this community. Um, more gatekeeping for children transitioning medically. Yes, yes. Uh, and so after, so as part of this piece, uh, Dr. Anderson, it came out in this piece that she had submitted an, an op-ed to the New York Times basically saying the same thing. The New York Times rejected it saying like, that's beyond our, our, our scope right now. Bullshit. The New York Times writes about trans stuff all the time, but they do it in one particular way. And you can go and you can go back five or six years and you can see how the tone has shifted to, uh, you know, five or six years ago, they might have written a piece about the tensions between gender, between self-ID or feminism and, and trans, trans activism. They wouldn't do that now. There's just been an almost total silencing. And then, and then when Barry's piece came out, really had some really shocking information in it. This wasn't picked up by the mainstream media. Um, so that's, I think, the other major difference is that uh, in the U.S., there's been almost total silence. On, unless what you are going to publish is unequivocally supportive of certain sets of subsets of trans activism, it's not going to get published. Um, yeah. Yeah. And in I the get, UK, guess, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I guess that that is my main interest is the difference in the conversation, the difference in the media conversation. I think The Guardian is a good example because... The Guardian has been publishing quite a few more gender critical perspectives. There was a famous example a while ago when The Guardian UK wrote a, a leader article about, that was very, very balanced, very nuanced about kind of effectively only saying with self ID, there are competing interests. Yeah. We have to acknowledge there are competing interests between the rights of trans people and the rights of women for single sex spaces and gender ID potentially could threaten that in some small way. And it was very nuanced, but then the Guardian's US staff basically penned an editorial saying, we completely distance ourselves from this transphobia. And it was a really fascinating, it does feel to me that there's, there's such a lot of heat around this topic in both the UK and the US, but there seems to be in the US still, if you, you can't even voice these opinions without being beyond the pale. Right. Like Barry Wallace is obviously outside yeah. the mainstream media, yeah. she can publish yeah. it. But there seems to be more, more of a, what's the word, um, more There's, groupthink in the US media than there is in the UK. There is a, a real conformity. And maybe that, has, I don't know about, about the UK, but in the US, in, in major, in like the elite papers, this is different on a local level. It's different on a, local papers barely exist anymore. Uh, regional papers barely exist anymore. But on, a, on a, the top sort of elite New York Times, uh, level it's a it's homogenous in terms of where people come from these people come out of the best universities the most expensive universities there are very few people working at these papers who are conservative um, they're almost it's very very homogenous so so the group think it's not even it's not even something you need to enforce it's the fact that these people are all the same 
um, not all of them, but but there is an overwhelming sort of profile of the of the reporter or of the op-ed writer. And it's interesting that uh, I'm glad you brought up the Guardian U.S. because one of the authors of that editorial in the Guardian U.S. condemning the Guardian U.K. was a guy I can't remember Sam Levin, I think his name is, and um, a few months ago he wrote a piece for the Guardian about this conflict at a spa in Los Angeles called We Spa. And the story, so basically this video went viral online of a woman freaking out at the spa because she said there was a guy, a, a, some, a man with a penis in the women's changing area or the women's spa. And the Guardian US wrote a piece basically saying that this was a, this was a hoax and a bunch of other outlets did this. And including the author of this uh, this op ed, this op ed uh, condemning the Guardian UK for their their turfiness, which is hilarious that anyone would see the Guardian UK as turfy. And uh, anyway, so it turns out that this wasn't a hoax, and so the someone was was charged with a crime. And so by going out of his way, the Guardian going out of their way to call this a hoax, they were defending a literal sex offender, someone who has been arrested multiple times for exposing himself to women and girls. So that's how, that's where this, it can take you to some weird places when in an in, in effort to be a good activist, you are defending literal sex offenders. Mm. Yeah, and there is this sort of weird um, view of the UK as this sort of turf island from mm -hmm. the US. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think part of this is just because of self-ID and the reformations to the proposed reformations to the Gender Recognition Act. I mean, that's really why the conversation, I think, is different in the UK and the US is because in the UK, it went much further in terms of legal reforms, national legal reforms that would have affected everybody. And so, of course, this became a much larger conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And something that isn't that isn't just being talked about among like hyper online people or feminists or whoever. This is something that everybody was talking about. I'm not sure. I'm sure it wasn't everybody, but it was a you know a mainstream story. Whereas mm -hmm. in the in the U.S., this is really um, still sort of limited to particular spaces. Yeah, it's it was fascinating seeing many of my kind of wokest, most left wing female friends being radicalized by this. Yeah. Over the last kind of two or three years with the with the with the um, self ID. And also, I, I know a couple of people, friends of mine, documentary makers. I've been a documentary maker for, for about 10 years who also went through a period of making quite high profile films about this topic and were also radicalized by it. They got a kind of th these are people who've made films about Syrian refugees have mm -hmm. made war films. And they found this topic in particular was the one that they got the most blowback. They got the most kind of um, unexpected and unavoidable and just irrational response that, that they could have kind of come out, came out yeah. the other side, yeah. battle hardened with some form of kind of almost PTSD. Yeah, it does. It does radicalize people because if you and I've seen this. Uh, many times, if you, you know, you let's say you're an example, you're a college student and you want to have an, you want to organize a night for lesbians and then you're called out by your community because your version of lesbianism doesn't include males those are the sort of things that you know that radicalize people because if you say the wrong thing maybe you're, you're not even sure that it is the wrong thing but it's apparently the wrong thing and you get dogpiled it changes mm -hmm. you um so the tactics i don't think are particularly effective in terms of winning people to their side it's sort of using brute force yeah, no, that reminds me of a good example. So I have also led men's retreats. So mm -hmm. we, we've, we've led um, kind of transformational work for a good few years, and some, some of it was men's retreats. And I've always kind of wondered, like it's a little bit countercultural, a little bit worried that we might get um, kind of attacked for it. We actually mm -hmm. had good coverage in both The Guardian and the BBC. And the only concerted kind of negative feedback that we've had we got the, these sort of messages that felt like a kind of organized campaign. Firstly, that said, would you let a trans man into your, into your retreat? And we got a kind of response to that um, effectively that was, that was yes, mm -hmm. we, we, would, we wouldn't block anyone. Mm -hmm. If they identified, we want to talk to them first, make sure they weren't coming to make a political point, but yeah. sure. Um, yeah. like we, and, but 
the fascinating thing was we realized it was actually a group of women, TERFs effectively, who were, what was motivating them was how come you're allowed to do this? Right, and, and we're, we're not, not to. whenever we organize yeah. a women's event, we get asked, would we let a would we let a, a trans woman in? And we're attacked for having women only events. And they were upset that we were running men's events without having the same kind of yeah, which is backlash. very it's very real. I mean, you see in the US, this is probably true in the UK as well. Language is shifting really rapidly. So when I listen to national public radio or or turn on cable news, I'm less likely now to hear the term mother or woman than I am pregnant people. Um, you know, they use terms like menstruators, uterus havers. This does not happen with males. Nobody calls men prostate havers. It just doesn't happen. So I, I completely understand why people bristle at that. It's very aggravating. There's a, this story that I did for Andrew Sullivan a while ago. Um, I spoke to the organizer of an event in Portland. It was a, a monthly lesbian dance night. And uh, it was protested because it was a lesbian event. You know, this is like, you don't, you very rarely see this in, in, in gay male spaces. Very few people are complaining about male bathhouses that don't allow vaginas in them. I'm sure it happens somewhat, but it's, it's not, it's sort of expected with lesbian spaces or female only spaces now. Yeah. And I mean, you just hinted at that a little bit, but there is the sort of radicalization on the other side that does shade into bigotry sure quite often for sure i mean there are i don't like the term turf because it is so often used to harass people but there are trans exclusionary radical feminists who say vile things about trans women and men oftentimes there's a lot of overlap um i sort of stumbled accidentally into a into a corner of like real turf Twitter. It's interesting, like I'm always called a turf and sort of the people that I follow are considered to be um, radical in this way, but no, 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 we are not. We are not people who are, who are concerned about uh, self ID and, uh, and you know, youth transition are not, are not the people um, generally saying horrific things about trans women. So that it definitely exists. Yeah, and the one, the last thing I wanted to kind of mentioned was the Stonewall example because I think mm -hmm. that's a really it's a really key moment in the UK because Stonewall was you know, LGBT uh, charity that did a huge amount of good in the past and has has just so a, a raft of public bodies were signed up to the Stonewall diversity scheme that have in the last kind of six months or so gradually you've seen more and more of them moving away there's been a lot of controversy over basically trans activism, Stonewall becoming more of a trans activist organization than a kind of equal rights organization. And a lot of people flagging up, hang on, this is controversial. This is actually a particular view of gender that they're pushing that is not based in fact. And it, it's a very ideological organization. And we've seen, we saw quite a few major public bodies moving away from Stonewall. And the fascinating thing was that we found out why about a week ago when the BBC published this podcast series mainly focused on Stonewall's influence on the BBC, which yeah. I think is fantastic. The BBC totally. the, <laughs> only, the only media organization in the world that would publish a yeah. lacerating 10 part yeah. series about their own, their own kind of infiltration by this organization. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, validates my license for it personally. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. But yeah, what was fascinating is you realize like, oh, that's why all of this happened. Like in the, in the background, this podcast series was being put together these hard questions were being asked of all of these different organizations and a lot of the, the kind of subterranean movement suddenly made sense. Mm -hmm. And also like this, this, this podcast series seems to have blown up and mm -hmm. Stonewall is, is now kind of being exposed, especially because the paradox of the BBC being an impartial, supposedly impartial organization and then being infiltrated and everything they do being marked by this ideological activist organization. Like that is a really fascinating and I think quite a far-reaching and important kind of development in this mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah the story is fascinating I've only listened to I think the first three parts of the of the series um, and I, I 
I'm tremendously impressed that the BBC didn't didn't shut this down <laughs> when uh, although it doesn't sound like they were very forthcoming as well. The BBC does not come uh, come out looking good in, in at least the episodes that I've listened to, even though it's published under the BBC banner. Um, they come across looking uh, looking naive in a lot of ways. Um, yes. It's yeah. And I think they I think let, let's let's yeah put a flag in that because they also, I think, failed to put anyone up and Stonewall unbelievably haven't put anyone up which is yeah. which is astonishing and shows like the people behind a lot of this ideology don't feel that they're accountable right right well they're not accountable but the, i think i think you're i think that things are shifting in a way um there's small signs of it small signs but again in the us at least there's always a backlash and maybe this is the backlash but there will be more backlash to this backlash um you know from the dave chappelle special so it's just sort of a small signs, small th- signs that things are sort of coming a little bit to their senses. Although I saw today, Margaret Atwood tweeted something today about, she tweeted an article um, and the headline was something like, why we can't say women anymore. And she's now getting absolutely dogpiled for that, which is very interesting to see Margaret Atwood become a, become a, the, the enemy. The latest punching bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just to just to summarize, where you think there are small signs, but you think that it will it'll just seesaw again in the US. Yeah, I think that's gonna happen for a while. And then I think eventually this stuff will dissipate because that's how these sort of social movements or moral panics or whatever you call them. Um I do think that in five or ten years, maybe sooner. We're going to see a lot more people, a lot more women in particular, uh, detransitioners coming out. We've already seen it. I mean, I wrote a story on detransition, my first foray into this world in 2017. And then it was hard to find detransitioners. And a lot of them were anonymous and they were uh, very hesitant to speak up. And that is absolutely changing now. Um, they're coming out in more and more numbers. There was a paper out today by Lisa Littman at Brown, or formerly at Brown University, um, about detransitioners. I think this is one of the first probably uh, peer reviewed studies about detransitioners. So I think that there are small signs that things are shifting. And I do think that at some point we're gonna look back at this moment, especially when it comes to pediatric transition and think what the hell were we thinking? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that again, there was the whole control. That's another thing that happened in the UK as well with the Tavistock Center mm-hmm. and the Kira Bell case, right? Which again is slightly different from the U.S. because the National Health Service, right? It, it's fascinating, like the differences between, like you were talking about, sort of state laws versus federal laws in the U.S. Mm-hmm. makes such a difference. In the U.K., what seems to make a difference is that there is a sense of like collective health care that means it everyone is involved. It's not just right. a, an insurance issue or a local kind of choice issue. It also like, well, if the NHS is funding this, then suddenly everyone feels that they have a say. There's a sort of social right. cohesion around some of the decisions that are made that maybe is lacking in the US. Absolutely. I mean, it, the, the state that you live in depends on the health care. I mean, depends on what is legal for you to do. Like in the US, if you live in Texas and you're seven weeks pregnant and you want to get an abortion, you can't do it. You know, mm-hmm. so so our politics are much much more more uh more local than in the uk healthcare especially when it comes to things like education and healthcare and these other sort of culture war issues that shouldn't be culture war issues but they're now culture war issues um yeah the same thing is true of trans healthcare if you're a if you're a youth in oklahoma you're going to have a different uh different access to different interventions than if you are youth in california awesome casey thanks so much for making time really enjoyed it and i um yeah i think you're going to continue to cover whether it is a backlash or an anti-backlash on your podcast you can have plenty of material for the future yep but can't get away from it thank you so much for having me it's good to see you thank you for watching all the way to the end if you'd like to join conversations like this check out a digital campfire you get access to a load of member only films you can watch live ask questions come to our book club our wisdom gym sessions and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.